Scott. This is video class number 38 of Understanding Revelation. I hope you're having a wonderful day. If you're a child of God, you are in Christ Jesus. Well, that's one of my favorite terms in the whole New Testament. Paul used it about 170 times in his epistles. In Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. He is our identity today. He is your identity today. Praise the Lord. Uh, well, we're going to get right into Revelation today. We're going to finish chapter 17 and get into chapter 18. Again, this is video class number 38. And if you have started with us from the very beginning, you, rem you might remember me saying that it's going to be this video class going through Revelation is going to take between 40 to 90 uh, video classes. And that's a big gap there between 40 and 90. I didn't, really didn't know, but it's looking like it's going to end up being about 55 around there. And I'm thankful that we're not on any time clock. We're not on any semester system. So we can just go through it without having to rush through certain portions of the book Revelation. So praise the Lord. Uh, if you haven't done so already, sub subscribe to the Corner Ministries YouTube channel comment, share it, that like it, that means thumbs up, and uh, would love for you to do that. You can get all the rest of the teachings that we do on our YouTube channel here. So let's pray and ask for the help of the Holy Spirit as we always do, and uh, believe for His blessings. Let's pray. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. We're so thankful that, God, you care for us. We thank you, Lord, that you're our Father, and we are in you, Jesus. We ask you for the help of your Holy Spirit, Lord, to teach and to understand. I ask for your blessing upon all those watching spiritually, mentally, Lord, physically, financially, in every way, in the name of Jesus, amen and amen. Praise the Lord. Well, as I said, we're going to get more into Revelation chapter 17. And one of the most fascinating chapters, I think, in the entire Bible, because it deals with what we started to deal with last video class, and that is the great whore of Revelation chapter 17. And I know that's strong terminology, but that is the term that John used from his vision, that's whom he saw in his vision in, in uh, Revelation chapter 17. So I'll put it on the screen here, and we're going to pick up today in verse 12, and uh, finishing out this passage, verses 7 through 14, the kingdom of the beast. And this is the Antichrist kingdom, primarily in the second half of the tribulation period. And it says, and the ten horns which you saw are ten kings, or you can, when it says kings, you could add to that the kingdoms, all right, which have received no kingdom as of yet, but shall receive power as kings one hour with the beast. And that one hour with the beast the beast is the Antichrist, and that one hour is really, uh, it's not speaking of a literal 60-minute time period, but it's speaking of the second half of the tribulation period, the last three and a half years. It says in verse 13, These have one mind, and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb shall overcome them, uh, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. I'm going to put some notes on the screen here and, and, and explain these verses here with through these notes, all right? And I'll put myself uh, up here as well in the corner. Uh, at this, in, this, in these verses, these are powerful because they give us insight into what's going to happen around the midpoint of the tribulation period as it concerns the revised Roman Empire, the, the, which are the ten horns, which are ten kingdoms. The revised Roman Empire, if you remember me from talking about it in the past, is that union of ten nations in the area of the old Roman Empire, which is Europe, most of Europe, the Middle East, and Northern Africa, uh, during the tribulation period. But here in these verses... It tells us that something's going to happen to the revised Roman Empire, these ten kingdoms, these uh, uh, ten kings. It says in, in the note there, you can see it, the first bullet, verses 12 and 13. It lets us know that at the midpoint of the tribulation period, the revised Roman Empire, that's the RRE, 
will come under the control of the Antichrist. And according to Daniel 9 and verse 28, okay, the Antichrist will make war with three kings, defeat them, and because of that, the other seven kings will come under his authority. Now, it, all it says in verse 12, all right, in 13, it says, And the ten horns which you saw are ten kings which have received no power, a kingdom as of yet, but received power as one kings, as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind, and it mentions in verse 13, And they give their power and strength unto the beast. That means they will come under the Antichrist in the second half of the tribulation. One of the things that we see in Daniel 7 and verse 8 is, is some more detail on how that is going to happen. Let me read it. You can see it there on the screen. Daniel 7 verse 8, it says, I considered the horns. This is Daniel in his vision. He saw ten horns that were on a beast, and the beast that he saw was the old Roman Empire, all right? That's why it's the ten horns that we call them the revised Roman Empire. So he says, and I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn. Now that little horn is the Antichrist, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. And behold, in this horn were the eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things or pompous things about himself. What Daniel 7 verse 8 lets us know is that around the midpoint of the tribulation period, of these ten horns, the Antichrist is going to make war, or it could be uh, they will make war with the Antichrist with three of the ten kingdoms. So, Again, three of the ten kingdoms are going to make war with the Antichrist or vice versa, and the Antichrist is going to overcome them. And when he does that, the other seven are going to submit themselves under the authority of the Antichrist. And, and that is what's not given in Revelation. All it says in verse Revelation, in, in Revelation uh, 17 and verse 13, it says, and they will give their power unto the beast, all right, they will, meaning they will come under his authority. And we'll see some more about what the Antichrist will do or how he will use them more in, in chapter 17 in just a minute. And it says in verse 14, one, something so fast, and I, I find it very fascinating in a, not in a good way necessarily, but it says in verse 14 again, These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and King of kings, and they that are with him are called, chosen, and faithful. Now, when it says in verse 14, These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. It's talking about the armies that join the Antichrist, which include these ten kings and uh, portions of uh, of the armies from their kingdoms will come to the valley of Megiddo, as, that, as that's described in chapter 14, chapter 15 in particular. Um, they will come to the valley of Megiddo and uh, to join the Antichrist. But get this, and I mentioned this in previous video classes, they will actually think that they can defeat Jesus when he comes back again. That's what it's meant there in verse 14 when it says, These will make war with the Lamb, and the Lamb will overcome them. How will they make war with the Lamb? They will, they will come to the valley of Megiddo, knowing, again, that Christ is coming at some point in the future, and they have a twofold goal, and that is to de destroy Israel from off the face of the earth, annihilate all Jews. But secondly, to defeat Christ again when he comes back. They actually think that they can defeat Jesus. But they have believed the lie of the Antichrist and of the false prophet and of Satan. That, that, and because Satan believes that he can defeat Christ and he can, and he can stop God's plan. He can stop what the Bible declares. He really believes that he can. He believes his own lies. He's that deceived that he believes that. And so they will, they will think that they can, but of course, they're going to lose. All right, moving on in verse 15 through 18.
The next passage here, it says the destruction of the great whore. That is verses 15 through 18. And it says, And he said unto me, The waters which you saw where the whore sits are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. I mentioned this back in chapter 13, how the beast will come out of the waters. Okay, And that waters, that symbolizes, as it says right here, Peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. That's humanity. And it says in verse 16, And the ten horns which you saw upon the beast, these shall hate the whore. Now remember this, again, the ten horns, that's the revised Roman Empire, that around the midpoint of the tribulation period, they come under the authority of the Antichrist, all right? So they will they will hate the, the great whore, the harlot of Revelation 17, that apostate Christianity, which includes all religions, all right? They will hate the whore and shall make her desolate and naked and shall eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it in their hearts to fulfill his will and to agree and give their kingdom unto the beast and until the words of God shall be fulfilled. And the woman which you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Now, one of the things I just want to mention here is that, well, a couple of things, that the Antichrist is going to use the revised Roman Empire to destroy the great whore at, around the midpoint of the tribulation period. And why, why will uh, they want to destroy her? I've mentioned it in the last video class, but it's this for this reason. Because in the second half of the tribulation period, the Antichrist is going to lift himself up above all gods. Now, primarily the God of the Bible, which is the only true God, and Jesus, his Son, and the Holy Spirit, and those who claim the name of Christ, but all religions. It will be one world religion. Have you ever heard that expression before? One world religion. Well, that ultimately is not going to take place until the second half of the tribulation period, and that will be the Antichrist kingdom, that one world religion, all right? That will be a worship of the Antichrist. All right, I want to put here, I'm going to take myself off the screen here and put number eight to here, just a moment to see here. When it mentions just an important point about the great whore, number, we've already covered the first seven, but number eight, comes from verse 16, she will be destroyed by the Antichrist and the revised Roman Empire at the midpoint of the tribulation period. All right, I want to move on here to, the, to verse 18, because verse 18 gives us also some insight into the great, the great whore. Verse eight, uh, 18, it says, and the woman which you saw is that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Now, do you see it there? I put it in number nine, and that's the last point, important point I'm going to have about the great whore. But number nine, she is connected to that great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. Now, when John made that statement, when he said that great city which reigns, that's the, the word reign is in the present tense. It's not past tense, which reigned in the past. It's not that. It's not the great city which will reign in the future. Not that. It's in the present tense, which reigns presently, meaning right now in John's day, over the kings of the earth. Now that city would have been Rome. In John's day, you can read that in the notes, this would have been Rome. In the future... It could possibly, possibly be the rebuilt city of Babylon, but it's one of those things that, it's just one of those things that that is very, very clear to me when it says in verse 18 again, and the woman which you saw is that great city which reigns, again, presently over the kings of the earth. That's why those that believe that the great whore is the Roman Catholic Church, that is, verse 18 is one of the main verses that they will point to. There's many other things in Revelation 17 that will point to the Roman Catholic Church. For example, the riches, the also the, the golden cup that is filled with abominations, as it says of the great whore. And many 
view that as the the chalice that the priest and 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 ultimately the uh, the pope that they hold, all right, in which they take communion with, all right, and so uh, many point to that, and but especially verse eighteen here with the great city which reigns over the kings of the earth. In John's day, again, that was Rome. And it's very difficult, from my perspective, to disconnect the great whore from what John stated in verse 18. That statement, right? It's very difficult. That's why I have said personally, uh, my I lean towards it being the Roman Catholic Church functioning as an umbrella, all right, the main lead, organization and religion you could say and under the umbrella of the Roman Catholic Church coming all false religions and all so so basically all false religions with the Roman Catholic Church being somewhat of the lead is the great whore that is my personal opinion and so all right I'm going to move on here and uh, deal with some um, uh, other things and just moving on in chapter, we're going to actually move on into in chapter 18. Chapter 18, verses 1 through 8, God remembers the sins of Babylon. And it says in verse 1, And after these things I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was lightened with his glory. And he cried mightily with a strong, strong voice, saying, Babylon the great is fallen is fallen and the words is fallen is fallen is is said two times for emphasis verse 2 and has become the habitation of devils and the hold of every foul spirit and a cage of every unclean and hateful bird now that's symbolic there of unclean spirits verse 3 for all nations have drunk of the wine of her fornication and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her, and the merchants of the earth are made are, are waxed um, uh, rich through the abundance of her delicacies. And I, I put the word luxury there in parentheses because in this chapter in particular, uh, the King James translation, for whatever reason, uses the word delicacies and uh, uh, the abundance of her delicacies and we we don't think of delicacies today in that in the same way that they did back then but it were it means luxury all right now in this passage we see this that the destruction of the city of babylon as that's and that's what chapter 18 deals with if you remember back video class uh, our last video class we talked about chapter 17 deals with the religious aspect of Babylon, the great whore, uh, mystery, Babylon the great, okay, I think really connecting it to Babel of Genesis chapter 11, which was the first organized religious rebellion against God, uh, but then chapter 18 deals with the destruction of the uh, literal city of Babylon, again, now whether that is the literal rebuilt city of Babylon, or whether that is Rome, or whether that is uh, uh, just the, the worldly system, all right, or some even believe it's New York City. I've heard that interpretation before, okay, but nevertheless, it, it shows us it's a city, and this passage leans that way heavily. All right, now some view, again, Babylon in chapter 18 as symbolizing the world's ungodly system, and not a literal city. Now, I told you again, I would give you, show you, or tell you some other different views. Again, this is one of those views that I th thought would, would be is legitimate, all right? There's some view Babylon in chapter 18 as symbolizing the world's ungodly system, not a literal city. Now, I don't lean that way, but... I'm just presenting that to you. That's that's why some people interpret it as. All right, verse 3 lets us know that the nations of the world will be drunk with the influence of this literal city of Babylon. Again, whether it's literal, literal rebuilt city of Babylon or some, some other city, all right, I'm just going to say Babylon, all right, the city of Babylon. 
the nations of the earth will be made drunk with her fornication. And as we go through this, her fornication includes entertainment, demonic activity of every kind, as it says in, in, uh, in verse 2. I mean, she's become a habitation of devils. Can you just, how would you like that to describe your city, okay? And maybe some of you are thinking, oh yeah, that describes your city. Uh, no, it becomes a habitation of devils. That's what the rebuilt city of Babylon will become. That city, that's how evil this city is. Demonic activity, drugs, luxury, sexual morality, merchandise of every kind, all right? And so uh, that's just a, a quick rundown. I'm going to move on here, and we're going to talk about that some more and what Babylon will become because that this passage here and these verses, the first three verses, and really this whole uh, passage describes what the uh, rebuilt city of Babylon will become. All right, number one, one of the headquarters of the Antichrist in the second half of the tribulation period. And we've dealt with that before, but that's pretty much, I, I, I uh, view the whole chapter here. I see it as that one of the headquarters of the Antichrist in the second half of the tribulation period. That goes back to a previous chapter when it talks about one of the vow judgments will be upon the Antichrist uh, kingdom, the kingdom of the, of the beast, the seat of his kingdom. All right, so he has a kingdom, and every kingdom has a city, and it, this Babylon will become one of his headquarters. All right, um, number two, the center of demonic activity in the world. That's what's described in verse 2 here. The center of demonic activity in the world. Number three, the, sex, the, the center of sexual immorality in the world. It says, for all nations have drunk of the wine, the wrath of her fornication, and the kings of the earth have committed fornication with her. Again, fornication is the Greek word porne, from which we get the word pornography from. It will be a center, the center of sexual morality in the world. As we go through this, that will become even more clear. All right, number four, it will be the financial center of the world. All right, number five, it will be the merchandise center of the world. Verses three, we'll also see that in verse 11. All right, number six, this is a general statement, but it will be the most wicked city on the earth. Verses five through seven. We'll see that in just a moment. But the most wicked city on the planet. If you can just imagine, if it's one of the headquarters of the Antichrist, it will be a very wicked city. And from what we can tell here, it will be the most wicked city in the face of the earth in the second half of the tribulation period. All right, moving on, the next verses in this passage. It says in verse four, and I heard another voice from heaven saying, come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, and that ye receive not of her plagues. For her sins have reached unto heaven, and God has remembered her iniquities. Now, I'm going to stop here for a moment and just make this point. In verse 4, a voice comes from heaven saying, Come out of her, my people, that ye be not partakers of her sins, that ye receive not of her plagues, or the plague is really a judgment and affliction brought on by God because of sin. God's saying, come out of her, which if we take it in the time setting of the second half of the tribulation period, that means that there's going to be believers within that area of the world, and God is saying to his people, come out, get out. Very much like what Jesus said in Matthew 24, about Jerusalem, when the abomination of desolation goes into the temple and declares himself that he's God. That's Matthew 24 and verse 15. Jesus said it when it, to those in Jerusalem and the surrounding areas. When you see the abomination of desolation, which is the Antichrist, when you see him go into the temple, he said those in Jerusalem and, and Judea, flee, get out of there. And it's the same idea here that God, Jesus is, or this voice is saying, come out of the rebuilt city of Babylon. Get out of there so that you don't receive her plagues, all right? 
All right, now the next thing here I want to bring out in verse 6, it says, Reward her even as she has rewarded you, and double unto her double according to her works. In the cup which she has filled, fill to her double. The point is this, is that God is going to double his wrath being poured out on on the rebuilt city of Babylon. That's how wicked of a city this, this city is. God, it, the, the voice is saying, give her double unto her double. All right. So you could even say it might mean quadruple, but actually later on it says in verse six, in the cup which she has filled to her double. So the idea is double judgment, double the wrath of God being poured out on her. That's how wicked this city is. Now, verse 7 lets us know that Babylon's main sin is pride. In verse 7, it says, How much she has glorified herself and lived deliciously. Again, that's the King James, very unfortunate translation there. It means luxuriously. How, how she has lived luxuriously. So much torment and sorrow give her. For she saith in her heart, I sit as a queen, and am no widow, and shall see no sorrow. Point is this, again in verse 7, she, she, how much she has glorified herself. Again, Babylon's main sin is pride. And you know what? It's interesting is that that goes all the way back to Lucifer's fall. What was Lucifer's sin? It was pride. Pride. And what did Lucifer through the serpent, try to do with, with Eve. It really, he, tr he sowed doubt, he sowed seeds of doubt. For example, the first question in the Bible is, has God said? Again, sowing seeds of doubt. And the serpent said to Eve, you shall become as God. That, that's pride. Okay, so unbelief and pride to go together. And so pride is the first sin that ever existed, and it will be Babylon's main sin, pride. It is, it's, lucid. it's still Satan's main sin, pride, all right? But he's the embodiment of all sin. It says in verse 8, Therefore shall her plagues come in one day, death and mourning and famine and she shall be utterly burned with fire, for strong is the Lord God who judges her. So her plagues, her destruction, her judgment is going to come in one day, it says. One day. And we'll see later, later on, actually, it's going to take place in one hour. One hour her judgment will be. I'm going to move on to the next passage, verses 9 through 20. The, the world mourns the destruction of Babylon there in chapter 18. I'm just going to read it, and I'll, when I get down there, I'll take myself off the screen, and I just want to bring out a few points here, okay? Again, the world mourns the destruction of Babylon, verses 9 through 20. And the kings of the earth who have committed fornication and lived deliciously or luxury with her shall bewail her and lament for her when they shall see the smoke of her burning, standing afar off for the fear of her torment, saying, Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for in one hour thy judgment has come. That's what I said earlier, that this passage really supports the idea that this is speaking of a literal city. Now, whether that's the rebuilt city of Babylon or some other, some other city, it's a city. It mentions it there. Alas, alas, that great city Babylon, that mighty city, for one hour thy judgment has come. So earlier it said one day, now it's an hour. Verse 11, and the merchants of the earth shall weep and mourn over her, for no man buys their merchandise anymore. Notice why the merchants of the earth are mourning. It's because they can't buy and sell with her anymore. So they're mourning not because they have a sincere love, all right, for Babylon, but it's it's greed, all right? Again, it's the most wicked city on the face of the earth. There's nothing good about uh, the rebuilt city of Babylon or this city. All right, verse 12. 
the merchandise of gold and silver and precious stones and of pearls and of fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet and all the, uh, and all fine in wood and all manner vessels of ivory and all manner vessels of precious wood and of brass and an iron iron and marble notice all these different merchandise uh, uh, things in verse 13 and cinnamon and odors and ointments and frankincense and wine and oil and fine flour and wheat and beasts and sheep and horses and chariots and slaves and souls of men now I just want to put a couple points here uh, up that I mentioned earlier. The world mourns over the destruction of Babylon for selfish reasons. That's why I mentioned earlier. The merchants of the earth, going back to 11, they stand afar off and they mourn and weep, all right, because no man can buy from her anymore. So it's not some sincere love that they have for Babylon. It's, it's greed. All right, the other thing I want to mention here. It's so very easy to skip over, and so uh, in verse 13, in verse 12 and 13, it mentions all these different merchandise items, I mean, from purple and silk and scarlet, wood, brass, iron, marble, wheat, beasts. At the end of verse 13, it says, uh, uh, beasts and sheep and horses and chariots, and look, notice what it says next, and slaves and souls of men. Now that, it's so easy to skip over that, but when it mentions slaves and, and souls of men, what that is referring to is human trafficking and prostitution, which those two normally go together, okay? Human trafficking, that's slaves, and souls of men, that's prostitution, all right? So it mentions souls of men, but this, that's men in general, it's, it's women children okay uh, it, it, human trafficking is is i think one of the most evil evil wicked sins that is on the planet that's ever existed but it's on the planet today and it's becoming more and more a prominent thing or say prominent i mean a more and more thing that's happening in the world more and more people are taking notice of it and trying to stop it but as time goes on in the end it's going to become more and more prevalent in the world. That's what is meant there when it says, and slaves and souls of men. Again, it refers to human trafficking and prostitution. The rebuilt city of Babylon is going to become the hub for that in the days to come, all right, especially in the second half of the tribulation period. And uh, again, that, that's what that is referring to. It is the most wicked thing I think there is. And so, all right, we're going to stop there today. And I uh, hope this has been a blessing to you, help to you. This is what's going to happen in this world to come. This ought to instigate us to let people know about Jesus. Because God has not appointed us unto wrath but unto salvation as the body of Christ, as the church. So, amen. Well, God bless you and have a wonderful day in Jesus. We'll see you next video class.